Hello there, everyone. Welcome to Digital Nomad Mastery, the podcast where we teach you how to make money while traveling the world, but also how to find unique places to travel to. And on today's episode, we have a really fascinating guest. His name is Brian Fay, and he's the founder of the Bosque Village in Mexico. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the Bosque Village uh, is a uh, out of the um, off the grid community where people live and uh, build community in Mexico. So we'll be asking uh, Brian a little bit about the origin story of what made him leave Seattle, Washington uh, in the Pacific Northwest to make his way down uh, to Mexico and how he's been able to host over 3,000 travelers at the village and a little bit about the village life. I mean, what's the experience like living there, etc. So we definitely have uh, a really unique guest today. So uh, welcome to the show, Brian. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your backstory for the sake of the listeners and viewers. Thanks. It's a pleasure to chat with you. Um, the basic story is that I'm a gringo uh, from the United States, and I was looking where to live in the world, and I chose very carefully. I took a map of the world and, and chose what I think is the best place to be for me. So I moved down to Mexico to a very rural place. It's in the middle of the woods. We're off the electrical grid. We capture rainwater, have a lot of uh, ecological systems in place to design a different way of living. So, uh, you know, it's one thing for you to leave Seattle and uh, just live by yourself uh, somewhere in the world. Whole other thing to actually start your own village. It's not a typical thing most people do. Like, uh, I don't know if you grew up as a little boy in Seattle dreaming, one day I'm going to have my own village in the middle of Mexico. But uh, what made you actually start the village itself? Well, I, I'm somewhat idealistic about uh, what we can do to make a better world. Uh, I think that you see a lot of people in the world are very frustrated with how things are, and they don't know what to do. Um, I grew up in a very religious community and had exposure to a variety of intentional communities and uh, didn't, didn't find that those suited me. So I became very interested in, in not just dreaming about or idealizing how we can live, but then implementing that. So that's what this project is all about. Yeah, so t tell me more about um, uh, um, when you moved to Mexico. Uh, was it firstly just a solo adventure, like you as a solo traveler, or did you have the intention of coming to Mexico with this purpose of starting a community? I had the intention of coming here to start something, yeah. I had been searching all over the world, not, well, not all over the world, I've been searching in Western Washington and Oregon and California. Mm -hmm. I had considered Argentina. Uh, but really, Mexico was close to the United States. The language isn't that difficult. The people here are very welcoming. The climate is amazing all year long, which is very important to me. Um, so yeah, it was very intentional. Um, and of course, it's been an adventure, and I've had to adjust myself over the years. It's been, it's been very difficult. But I'm still uh, staying with the original intention of having a space where we can create our own social rules, our own social contracts, and escape from some of the things we're trapped in in the default world. So I would love to take I would love to take our listeners and viewers back to that origin, to those first few days, the weeks, the months, <laughs> the years. Tell us about uh, how were those days? Uh, when did you arrive, and uh, how did you grow this community from the ground up, literally? Right. Well, uh, I arrived, I think it was June 20th in, in 2004. So that makes it uh, about 13 years. Um, and the, the place itself is 83 acres in the middle of the forest. Uh, there was two buildings and they were abandoned. So there was no water, no electricity. And it was extremely difficult. I didn't speak the language. Um, so for three years, uh, I was, you know, pretty alone and, and just trying to figure things out and building and planting. The, the, the start was much slower than I expected. And of course, being an outsider, uh, in my relations in the local town uh, were not yet developed. At this point, I have very excellent relations with, with locals and have good friends. But, you know, it was, it was two years before I got internet and uh, solar panels. So it was uh, difficult and lonely. I, I don't think most people would want to do this. So uh, how did it transition from loneliness um, and that difficult emotional time uh, that you faced 
to actually uh, starting to get people to come into the village and stay there and uh, help you build it? Well, I started inviting more people and I had a, a couple people come down and stay for longer periods of time. Uh, my ex-girlfriend came down and she was here for uh, five years. And I've had some people come and stay for six months. Uh, so it's building slowly. Uh, I still don't have very many long-term visitors and I'm open to that. I would love to set up partnerships with people, especially with people who can work online as digital nomads or, or who are location independent. This place is perfect for them. But what I'm looking for now is to develop a, a stable core team that wants to be here long term. And that way we can uh, have an easier time of hosting people who just want to come through for a week or for a month. Makes sense. So tell us about the, the vision and the value system. Um, you mentioned things like being off the grid, uh, not being stuck to society standards, uh, living uh, amongst nature. Tell us about uh, more of that vision. Unpack that vision and the values, Brian. Sure. Well, as we design a better culture, uh, we do have to figure out, well, what ethics are we going to live by? And one of those ethics is to use much less energy, radical conservation. And for some people, that, that sounds like, oh, I won't have as much stuff. Well, it's a trade-off. You know, we use way less stuff, aren't trapped by that stuff either. So it, it's a way to live cheaper. It's a way to live healthier. Um, you know, here there's no cars driving around. The air is clean. Uh, it's an invite-only space, so we don't have to deal with assholes. You know, uh, we, we, people make an application to come here. Uh, we're all expected to treat each other with respect. And even though we have communication difficulties because people are coming from different cultures, we're expected to enjoy those rather than use those as points of conflict. Ethics really are <clears throat> about caring for the earth long term, uh, caring for people, um, and living in a very conscious way. And I don't mean that in some kind of pseudo spiritual way but really considering every single detail of how we live, how we eat, how we use time, how we take care of each other, um, what projects we pick to, to get involved with or not. Yeah, you know, those values are something I think most humans should share, you know, caring about people, caring about the planet, caring about resources, but unfortunately, uh, you know, maybe big corporations don't uh, care as much about that, even though the individuals working in those corporations probably have those same values. Uh, so tell us about the village itself. I mean, um, uh, when you think of a village, um, uh, there's different connotations. Um, so tell sure. us about your village, the Bosque village. Sure. Um, well, physically, uh, it's about 83 acres or 33 hectares, if you use that system. It's oak, <clears throat> oak pine, and madrone forest. So there's lots of trees here. Uh, a lot of people, when they think of Mexico, they think it's all desert and jungle and beaches. Well, that's not true. Um, so uh, it's it's not that hot, really. Um, the days are certainly hot sometimes, but there's always shade. The nights can be a little chilly. At this point, I have, uh, I don't even know how many buildings. I think 14 or 15 buildings. Uh, people stay in cabanas or huts. We're now building with adobe, which is like cob. And uh, that's just an earth mixture. So that makes uh, the buildings very comfortable. They're warm at night and cool during the day. Uh, one odd aspect is the electricity. Uh, we are off the grid with a very small solar panel system. And I know that electricity is very important to digital nomads. Uh, so I'd actually like to increase the number of solar panels we have. For now, we have enough electricity for a few people to use computers. And we have enough bandwidth so that they can do a video chat or certainly audio uses much less bandwidth. And for people like programmers, well, they don't really need much bandwidth at all. In addition, um, outside of the Bosque, we have partnerships with nearby people so that people can stay somewhere that has internet, that has a more regular water system and is more like a normal house. So uh, other things about the Bosque that make it a little different than other places is that we have a variety of activities. Uh, the majority of people who come here are not digital nomads. We certainly welcome digital nomads, but, but most people are coming here because they want to experience a different culture. They, they may have their own projects, whether it's architecture or art or something uh, agricultural. 
and other people are coming here and and if they stay for about a month then they there's a rolling cycle of various activities where they can be learning about permaculture energy systems uh, and and really about human culture itself uh, sounds fascinating by the way uh, you know we're currently in Trinidad and, and we're heading uh, to South America for the next few months but we're making our way up up, up to Mexico so highly um, you know looking forward to actually experiencing life off the grid in the bosque uh, the only thing I can think of we've done is like you know sleeping in the middle of the Amazon jungle without electricity without internet uh, that was definitely uh, difficult with the wife and kids um, I, I, I didn't know about families. Uh, tell me about uh, what kinds of uh, people have stayed there. Uh, is it mostly single people? Is it couples? Is it families? Is it all of the above? Uh, tell me about the type of people that are drawn to the Bosque culture. Well, we've had all kinds of people, really. Um, my preference is to about, have about half Mexicans and half foreigners. Um, in general, it has been skewed towards people in their 20s. I would actually like to raise the average a little bit to have a little bit older demographic. Um, we we have had singles certainly uh, for single travelers, particularly uh, single female travelers. Uh, this is a kind of traveling that's very safe for them. You know, where instead of staying in a different place every night with a new set of challenges and risks, they stay in a place for a week or a month. They get to know people, so that's better for them. Uh, we do get couples through. We haven't had a lot of families come through, um, and and there's certainly no problem with having families here. The things with families, I, I want to make sure that parents that parents take very good care of their children, that they keep track of them. This is an actual forest; it has wild animals, um, and I, I I do want to build an actual kid kid via, a special area for kids. I haven't done this yet. But uh, as I get more and more requests from families, the priority goes up on that. Uh, the vision of that is to make kind of an adventure playground where kids have, you know, logs and shovels and, and it's a, it'd be fenced area with no poisonous plants in it, no rattlesnakes. And I would like to hire local staff that are aware of kids' needs and can lead kids' activities. And that way, when, when young families come here, uh, the service we can provide is that the parents actually get to have some fun on their own and learn. Because I know, I mean, you know, <clears throat> traveling with a kid is a bunch of work. Yes, tell me about it. <laughs> so, if, so if you had a place where you, you feel secure, where there's no car zooming around, and you can drop your kid off for six hours, and that kid is then playing with Mexican kids, learning Spanish, the Mexican kids are learning English, they're all running their asses off, and <clears throat> pardon me, and having a great time, then everybody's really benefiting at a maximal level. And those kids at night will be tired, they'll zonk out, go to sleep, and the parents can stay up talking around the campfire with everybody else. Sounds like a beautiful moment. I can almost visualize myself there with the kids. Uh, you know, uh, while we're traveling, that's definitely uh, uh, something we're afraid of is the safety factor, you know, like especially in places like South America, we're taking the kids and there's like car zooming back and forth and, uh, you know, like it, it's definitely dangerous in that sense of the word because you get, you get hit any time. And there's obviously the issues of um, safety with like not walking around at night, etc. Uh, tell us about the safety factors we need to consider when we're in the Bosque or just Mexico generally. Sure. Well, in Mexico generally, uh, it's very safe especially traveling with a family, you're going to be able to connect a lot with people. Mexico is a very child-focused culture. People love children here. So um, I know a lot of people see on the news uh, that there's conflicts in Mexico, and there are conflicts in Mexico. I've been here since 2004. I'm very aware of them. But those conflicts are very unlikely to affect you in any way. Uh, they just If you're not involved in narco-trafficking, you're just not important. The public transport system here is excellent, so you can travel that way uh, at very low cost. Uh, so I think traveling in kids uh, with kids in Mexico is great. Um, I have had some families come through, and they've, they've really enjoyed it. People are so very open and, and giving with their time and their culture. As far as the Bosque goes, uh, like I said, it's a forest. And so, uh, I mean, we, we were evolved to be in forests, so it's actually very healthy and good for us to be in them. But I think that people uh, coming from a city need to respect 
that this is not like some kind of magic nature land. You know, it's not Disneyland. Uh, there are poisonous plants here. There are poisonous mushrooms here. Uh, there are there's wildlife here. Now, I am I am not, I don't have a kid myself. I like kids, but uh, it's just not what I'm going to do. What I've been starting to do is I'm removing. There's two po there's two plants here that are particularly poisonous, uh, and I'm removing those from the most common areas, so that kids won't be near them. Uh, and then, as far as wild animals go, there's nothing that really horribly dangerous here. There's no bears or lions that are going to hurt anybody. Uh, there, there's some other insects and things that, you know, really aren't going to bug you. Like there's tarantulas, but apparently those don't even bite. They just look scary. Uh, there are rattlesnakes and, uh, you rarely ever see them. I think I've seen rattlesnakes like five times in 13 years and they're in fairly remote areas. Recently, we did just have a pair of rattlesnakes that was living near a building. And in general, I'm here to increase wildlife and protect it. But in that particular case, we killed the rattlesnakes because we don't want rattlesnakes living right next to a building. Hmm. Other than that, kids will be very safe here. Uh, we still got to keep track of them. They will fall down. They might get poked by a stick. They might scrape their knees. But I think that's healthy for kids. I yes. think that they should be playing in nature. And I think the adults should be playing in nature too. Absolutely, you know, uh, play is a universal language, and uh, I'm glad you brought up the fact that kids uh, kids should play, but also adults, because uh, uh, before I became a dad, I didn't play. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> I had fun, I went to movies, etc. But there's a whole different type of play when you hang out with kids. So I, I'm glad you brought that up. So Brian, <laughs> uh, tell us more about the funding of this village project that you've developed. I mean, uh, it's obviously not cheap to build up all these buildings, and uh, there are costs associated with obviously feeding the people, etc. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the the costs associated with uh, running uh, the boss gig. Well, the place was originally self-funded. I used to work uh, in computing up in the Seattle area. And so I funded it myself for many years. And I, I had people come at very low cost to them. Uh, at this point, I'm changing things quite a bit. I'm, I'm setting up a couple pricing structures for people to come. And also, I'm, I'm looking at doing more crowdfunding and also looking for grants because uh, we're not a resort. We're not just here to, to have a good time, although we will do that too. Um, we actually are trying to develop systems here to develop a sustainable future for the planet. So I take this project very seriously. I, I'm not here to escape the world. I am here to build a better one and then work on, on spreading those systems so that as energy becomes more expensive in the world, we already have good alternatives developed that we can switch to. So funding right now is extremely tight, but I finally have become willing to ask for and to accept donations. So you can find us online, and I really uh, would welcome any help at all. I've gone as far as I can go as a uh, former wealthy geek. <laughs> Former wealthy geek, love it, and uh, you know you're, you're spreading the wealth and sp making a difference. And I'm glad you really brought up this, um, you know, this issue of escapism because traditionally, when you think of uh, off the gridders, um, you think that they've escaped and they're kind of hermits and there's something wrong with them or they they seem to have just like uh, withdrawn. Uh, that's a stereotype, uh, you know. Uh, there's the famous movie. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, Mr. Wonderful or um, something of like that, <laughs> Mr. Fantastic. I think I did. Yeah, but anyway, uh, they are definitely off the gridders who escape from reality. But but uh, you've done a little spin on the concept uh, by saying you're not escaping, but your actually goal is to change the world. Uh, tell me more about that big vision. It's a big, lofty, um, hairy, audacious goal to have that big, um, you know, meta narrative. Tell me more. Sure. A couple aspects of that is one is energy systems, um, showing how we can live with far less energy than we use uh, in the city. We only have 340 watts of solar panels here. People have more than that on their RVs. But I can have 60 people here, and they can be very happy, much more connected with each other, living a primal life, hanging, around around, hanging out around the campfire. And, and so we don't need that much energy. So conservation is one part of that. Another part of that is learning how to cook with solar energy, learning how to cook very efficiently with wood energy. Um, and then also 
picking and choosing what technologies we use and how. For example, at night, we do want to have light. We don't just want to sit there in the dark. So we have LED lights. We don't even use a lot of those. So the energy is one aspect. Another one is architectural. Um, we are building with natural materials here whenever possible. And that primarily is then stone and dirt. In general, I don't even want to build with wood because we can use wood for making furniture or things it's really best for. Uh, another aspect is agriculture. Uh, I don't like to irrigate. The way we do agriculture and the effect of agriculture on even the evolution of human beings, on the evolution of human society, has been horrible. And, and you can go read from smarter people than me about that, about the effect agriculture had on who we became as humans. Now, I can't fight all that. I'm a, I'm a human too. I come from that world. But what we're doing here is developing methods of agriculture that don't steal water from some other system and that take care of the soil and build the soil. So we don't have big fields full of crops. We're doing small amounts of crops mixed into the forest. This is often called food forest farming. We do have chickens and rabbits, uh, and that's a compromised position because we don't do a lot of hunting or something. So, so we don't eat hardly any meat, and, and certainly uh, vegetarian diet is always the, the, the default here. I'm very much a supporter of vegetarian lifestyle, but I'm also interested in how we can raise meat in a way where animals don't suffer and eat a little bit of it. Now, people are going to be mad at me from both directions on that. It's a compromised position. Um, now, those are three very important things, agriculture, architecture, and energy systems. The harder part is the social culture. Even if we solve the other three, we have this immense cultural problem where we are fucking each other over constantly. Pardon my language, but that's what we're doing. We are constantly supporting violence in a great many ways. We are, we are making ourselves lonely, feel betrayed. We can't trust each other. And we're, and we're doing this in an environment where we can now communicate at, at high levels all around the world, where we can travel anywhere. And so we've broken so far away from what we were culturally evolved to live in that, that pretty much, I think, very few people are actually happy with it. Now, I don't have magic solutions for that, and I'm not perfect. I'm not a guru, and I don't like gurus. But in this space, we can experiment with how to be our best selves, how to offer the best of ourselves to other people, how to try and reduce our levels of conflict. And that's really the more difficult part of the, the experimentation here. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be ongoing. You know, so far so good. You've survived for 13 years and you've uh, got 3,000 people into the community. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure you're going to have uh, many hundreds and many thousands more. So, uh, Brian, uh, tell us about um, actually staying there in terms of the costs. Um, you mentioned different pricing structures. Uh, what about things like food? Do you have to bring in your own or um, do you have some kind of system where you can actually serve meals to people? So tell us about the cost of someone who's potentially wanting to apply to visit as a guest. Sure. Yeah, in order to uh, come here, people need to study the place and decide if they really even want to be here. You know, many people should just go to a resort or something. It'd be better for them. Uh, there is an application that they can fill out if they're interested. And uh, the pricing varies depending on what their role is going to be. Um, in some sense, I wish I could not charge anyone. And I have I've done that. I funded people quite a bit. Can't do that anymore. And my interest in doing it is really reduced over time because I was funding people, you know, they're, they're traveling for three years and they want to make sure they come to Mexico and don't pay a dime for anything. I no longer have any respect for those people. They're abusing poor people around the world. So uh, at this point, there are options uh, for, for, for paying to be here. Um, I'm, I've been playing with prices, but it really depends on the role. Another option for people is that they could crowdfund their stay here. So we can give them photos and template text and on whatever different system they like, Indiegogo or other crowdfunding systems, they could actually crowdfund their own stay. We're also uh, crowdfunding the Bosque, and we then will be able to sponsor some people who want to come through for shorter times. Uh, we're also looking at other forms of funding, grants from foundations, uh, we're looking at uh, what products we can produce that, that can 
can support the place. I don't actually expect that will be a very big income stream. Um, but yeah, that's uh, heavy on our minds here. T huh, tell us about the food. Uh, I mean, that's a big uh, concern of people. Uh, do they need to bring in their own food and water, or uh, what are the options there for food and water? Um, water we have. We collect it from the rain, and we store it in big uh, cisterns and tanks. Uh, I do also buy a bottle of water from the outside for people who don't trust our water. Um, I've done tests on the water. I bought a water test kit, and I did like 20 tests on the water. It was all fine. I drink it. But if anybody's concerned, they can drink outside water. Uh, we have a food system here. It serves vegetarian food with a few exceptions. Uh, and that food uh, is bought locally or we grow it here. Because we don't irrigate, we have limits on when we can grow food and what we can grow. Uh, but, but during parts of the year, we have lots of food to eat and the gardens are full. Uh, the, I live in the state of Michoacan here. It's a great agricultural state. So we've got food right nearby growing, but we've also got tropical regions nearby. So we can be eating mangoes and papayas and coconuts. Uh, there's avocados all around here, so we like to eat a lot of avocados. Mm -hmm. um, so the food, we like to generally focus on fresher food. Um, and uh, we used to serve kind of international vegetarian cuisine, which was very popular with foreigners. They loved it. But the Mexicans would come here and they would be like, uh, I don't know what this is and I don't like it. They want food they, they can recognize. You know, they're not traveling the world. They're not signed on for something weird. So, uh, so what we did after that was we make healthy versions of Mexican food where we're using less oil, less fried stuff. Um, and everybody seems to be happy with that. Sounds good. You know, it's been uh, super inspiring to hear the story all the way from the origins to where you are now. I definitely wish you the best, uh, and I look forward to potentially staying there depending on our travels. Um, but tell us about how people can actually find uh, you online uh, if they want to find out more about the village itself before they make that decision of whether to apply. And if they do uh, choose to apply, uh, how can they do that? Sure. Uh, we're easy to find. You can look up Bosque. That's B-O-S-Q-U-E. That means forest in Spanish. Village. I think behind me there's a sign here. Uh, you can look up my name. My name is Brian, B-R-I-A-N, F-E-Y, Phi, or Fay, I guess. I changed the pronunciation some <laughs> years ago to, to adjust to other people. So Brian Fay at yeah. the Bosque Village. Uh, we're on Facebook. We have a domain name, bosquevillage.com. Uh, I write a lot on Quora, so you can find me on Quora. Uh, part of the goal is to share the experience. So we also have a, a YouTube channel you can subscribe to, watch videos there. Uh, and it really is important to study the place before trying to come so you're not surprised. That is one issue with couples coming here is sometimes one person in the couple knows a lot about where they're going. The other one has no idea and is in for a big surprise. So it's important that that both partners in a team uh, are kind of on the same page about wanting to come here. If you do decide you want to come here, there's an application on the Bosque Village website, and it's under visit, and you fill that out, and we'll get back to you, and uh, hopefully it's a good timing, and you'd make a good addition to the team. Sounds good, Brian. You, you know, uh, you definitely inspired me just through the short interview we've had. Um, I, I love what you're doing in terms of the fact that you're a uh, visionary, world changer, uh, you know, just uh, making a difference. And that's well, we need more people like that. So good on you for acting on these dreams and uh, inspiring others and, uh, you know, changing other people's lives through what you're doing. Thank you, sir. And I, I do want to, uh, if, you, if you end up coming up here, I would love to host a family. I would love to improve the space for kids. So when you're here, we can talk about what kids need and how we can have them have just an astoundingly amazing time and tire them out as well. So stay tuned, everyone. We'll do a sequel episode live on location. I won't be in Trinidad. I'll probably be in the location, seeing if we can get good enough internet where we can actually stream live, uh, doing a little Facebook Live as we walk around the village. So thank you, everyone. Now make sure you, uh, you check out Bosque Village. Once again, Bosque Village, uh, which means forest in Spanish and uh, village in English. So they're a little 
uh, combination of the Spanish and English together, uh, the multiculturalism aspect of the village. Uh, check it out, uh, bosquevillage.com. Uh, make sure you uh, uh, follow them on YouTube as well so you can see a little bit more of the inner workings of how the village operates. Uh, check out their fa fan page as well. Uh, like them on Facebook. And if you want to give back, donate, uh, they're definitely willing to take your money and run. Not just, just kidding. But take your money and build. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, if you're interested in staying as well, uh, make sure you uh, uh, check it out, uh, do your due diligence, your research, and apply at bosquevillage.com. Muchas gracias, señor. Nos vemos. <laughs> Muchas gracias. I uh, hear from Trinidad and uh, live over there in Mexico. Uh, make sure you subscribe to us as well. We're Digital Nomad Mastery on uh, digitalnomadmastery.com. We also have a YouTube channel where you can watch these videos. Uh, we can also just listen to them on iTunes and follow us on all of our social media as well. So happy travels, everyone, and we'll see you in the next episode of Digital Nomad Mastery. <laughs>